Hello, Outposters, and welcome to another Overlooked Movie, 1986's Space Camp. But before we go back to the 80s, let's take a stop off in the summer of 2001, when this trailer for Spider-Man was released. The candy from a baby! Woo! Yeah! Sit back and enjoy the ride! Yeah! cool got everyone pumped and then this happened yeah this just in you are looking at a breaking news story very disturbing about 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 there. that is the know, world trade we center and we have just done a report from the this morning to an explosion as we come on now we have serious news of a major very tragic suddenly that trailer was pulled and it's difficult to find it now, at, at least in any official capacity. I suppose that's for the best. It's just a comic book trailer, and that's a pretty specific image. Still, that didn't do anything to hurt the movie itself. And in fact, the scene with all the New Yorkers standing up against Goblin to help Spider-Man turned out to be a nice moment at a time when people needed it and were ready for it. Oh! 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 Come on up here, dumb guy! I got a little something for you! Yeah, keep your freaking ass! Leave Spider-Man alone! You got a big kind of guy trying to save a bunch of kids? Oh yeah, I got something for your ass! You mess with Spider, you mess with New York! You mess with one of us, you mess with all of us! It didn't really mention 9-11 by name or anything, so it still works today. Other movies have had real-life events intersect their release to a greater or lesser effect. The Matrix was erroneously tied to the Columbine shootings, mostly because the shooters wore black trench coats, even though there was no evidence they'd seen or knew anything about the Matrix. The Dark Knight Rises had a horrible incident where a crazy guy shot up a theater showing the movie. Doctor Strangelove was edited in certain places, and its release was delayed from November 1963, thanks to the Kennedy assassination that month. But none of these events really affected the perceptions of the movies themselves, perhaps because the connections were tenuous at best. But one movie wasn't so lucky, as its subject matter was nothing but a reminder of one of the worst tragedies in American history, 1986's Space Camp. Space Camp is a lightweight story about a group of kids who accidentally get sent up into space on the shuttle. It was a fun, if really scientifically inaccurate movie. It's not that great seeing it as an adult, but man, as a 15-year-old in the 80s obsessed with space, it hit all the right buttons. Unfortunately, it hit a lot of wrong buttons for the public at large thanks to the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster in January of that year. For those that remember it, it was a gut punch to our collective psyche. It was at a time when there was only a few channels on the air, and every one of them replayed that footage over and over again. So much that the entire disaster is burned into our collective memories. So, a movie about a shuttle mishap, even one that ends fine, wasn't going to work out so well in the summer of 1986. It was in and out of theaters, with many reviewers trashing it due to poor timing. It went to the video store's bottom shelves in the rental aisles and was pretty quickly forgotten. And that's a shame. While it has many problems and can't be called a classic, it does have a certain entertainment factor to it, or at the very least a curiosity. I mean, for God's sakes, it stars the Joker. Well, okay, not exactly the Joker. Not even using his current stage name, Joaquin. Instead credited as Leaf Phoenix, he plays the youngest of the group of kids, which includes Leah Thompson, fresh off her success from Back to the Future, Kelly Preston in a very early role, Tate Donovan, 
who's had a solid career in supporting roles and guest spots in many TV shows, but his most well-known role is probably the voice of Hercules in Disney's 1997 animated feature. Larry Scott, who played the Swishy Latrell in Revenge of the Nerds, is also a member of the group, and Tom Skerritt, who probably forgot he did this movie this year since Top Gun was also out. Finally, you have Terry O'Quinn, long before we know him as Locke on Lost. It stars Kate Capshaw, Willie from Indiana Jones, and the wife of the beard himself, Steven Spielberg. And if you could get her to play a role as polar opposite as Willie, this is it. Hell, even her hair is brunette instead of blonde. I absolutely love this movie at age 15, and admittedly much less so now. It's a prime example of a movie you see as a kid that you probably shouldn't revisit. Not all of them are classics. But it's also not nearly as bad as the box office flop it was. In fact, a lot of rocket and aeronautical engineers will point at this movie as an inspiration for their current careers. It appears to have found an audience in recent years, so much so that Disney Plus is looking to create a new version of the movie in a TV series format. I guess Goonies in Space was what they were going for originally. Let's hope the new version has a bit more realism put into it. Space Camp is cute for what it is. The biggest problem here is that there's absolutely no chance that anyone watching this movie will believe that this will end badly. This is a kid's movie after all. But the biggest surprise that probably elevates it far above the story and content is the music score done by John Williams himself. It really gives it a sound that makes it seem way better than what it is. Johnny always brings it. Space Camp is an actual place in Huntsville, Alabama, and is a very good place for budding geniuses to get started in aeronautics. What's so disappointing about the movie is the sloppy attention to scientific details given the subject matter. You think there's really an artificial gravity simulator in Huntsville? No. It's not just the scientific details either. It's well known that the launch site for NASA is on the east coast of Florida at Cape Canaveral. That's a good 10 hour drive from space camp, but a couple of kids sneak out on a date one night to look at the shuttle on the pad as if it was right next door. Look, maybe they wanted to move space camp for movie's sake, but I gotta wonder how many kids were disappointed when they went to the actual space camp and found out not only was it not anywhere near the launch pad, they were stuck in northern Alabama. It's just dumb things like that that take me out of the movie. It starts with Kate Capshaw's Andy, a little girl watching John Glenn's flight in 1962. She grows up to be a crack pilot and NASA train, but keeps getting passed over for a shuttle flight. To the movie's credit, they do not really try to blame it on sexism, but rather that it's just tough as hell and not everyone makes it. But that doesn't make it any easier for her to swallow, though. For some reason, she has a southern accent when she lands the plane at the beginning, but it disappears for the rest of the movie. I thought for sure I was getting up there this time. This is an engine test. You get your chance next time. Primary objective of the test. You're damn right I will. I don't want to hear about it. I can't hear it. You know why? Because you're all dead. You just disintegrated during re-entry. Since she can't go on the next flight, she's been assigned to space camp to be the astronaut trainer. Meanwhile, everyone is arriving at camp, kind of like all those summer camp movies back in the day. I think Meatballs has a lot to answer for. One of the teens doesn't want to be there, but sees Leah Thompson and immediately switches his card from yellow to blue so he can be on her team. And apparently this works and no one questions it. But then Max shows up, even though he's clearly in the wrong age group. He also knows Andy, and this is his third year. Jesus, I don't know if you've looked at the prices of Space Camp, but not including airfare and Uber and whatever the hell else. It's a good 1500 bucks per kid. I don't know what it was in those days, but let's say the inflationary equivalent. Anyway, he doesn't want to be with the little kids anymore, so Andy relents and lets him be a part of the team. Jesus, with this kind of attention to detail, no wonder the shuttle blew up. The truth is, NASA, especially in those days, would have never been this lax on these sorts of things. I don't think even at space camp. This is a serious camp, and there are actual astronauts today who went there as kids. It's not an easy camp, and it's definitely not for some teenager who just wanted to get a car out of his dad, 
or a little kid obsessed with Star Wars who just wanted to be with the big kids. Oh, the middle class problems these poor kids endure. Also, the fact that Andy knows this little guy tells me this isn't her first go around at camp, which is not what NASA trained astronauts typically do, but whatever. So, the stuff on the ground is okay. It's very typical, these misfit teens just can't work together type of antics. Tish, played by Kelly Preston, has a photographic memory and a high IQ, but clearly just wants to have fun, as Ms. Lauper sang back in the day. Latrell wants to be an astronaut so he can open up a fast food restaurant in space. I want to be the first guy to have a fast food franchise in space. Rudy T's. Are you serious? That's either awesome forward capitalist thinking or really racist. I can't figure out which. Oh, and there's a $27 million robot named Jinx that NASA has running around space camp doing stuff. I really don't know what other than ending up being a plot device. This is part of the E.T. Star Wars effect where you had to have some cute alien or robot in all your kids' movies. Also, just in case you didn't make that connection, Max is the biggest Star Wars nerd and tries to make everyone that he interacts with a character from that movie. R2-D2, I mean Jinx, the robot, takes everything literally. So when Max comments he wishes he could go up into space, Jinx is the one that makes it happen. So Kevin, Catherine, Rudy, Tish, and Max now must go through training together, which is kind of fun. It definitely looked like a hell of a good time to me at 15 years old. I mean, who wouldn't want to do this stuff? They film much of this at actual space camps, so a lot of what you're seeing here is the real stuff that they did. I'm sure much of it is updated now, but it's, it's still pretty cool to see. Of course, the kids just can't work together. Catherine is bossy, takes it all too seriously, while Kevin just can't take any of it seriously and is too busy drooling over Catherine. Hey, it's Leah Thompson. I don't blame him too much. Andy, of course, takes it very seriously, but this is an actual astronaut training as much as they try to make it that way. No one's going to die. The rest of the camp comes across a lot like a publicity video. Come to space camp, kids. We've only blown up one shuttle so far, so your odds are good. The kids, along with Andy, finally go aboard the actual space shuttle which is 11 hours away, I'm still going to harp on that, to sit in while they test the engines. Jinx overrides the NASA computers to simulate a bullshit problem, so the only thing they can do is actually launch the space shuttle, or else it will blow up and kill the kids. Ugh, I hate this robot so much. There are actual reasons to have it launch, and actual things they would be prepared for in these events. To bring in the robot to make it all happen, and then to later on save the day, makes NASA look like a bunch of boobs. So, off the shuttle goes. There's a moment when Andy needs to get in the pilot's seat and switch with Catherine, when the G-forces throw Catherine against the back wall, killing her instantly. <laughs> no, she's totally fine. So at uh, some point, we're going to put some science in our science fiction movie, yes? Once they get into orbit, they have to get some oxygen. This flight was never really equipped to go up. So they go to a space station. Now that doesn't really bother me, that it's the whole idea of having a space station in the first place. But it's bizarrely set up with oxygen tanks that are just strapped to some sort of lattice structure. I have no idea what the deal is with this, other than make it too small for Andy to get them so Max can have his big moment. This makes no sense. I would assume at some point astronauts were going to need to get those tanks. And if it's too small for Andy, well, how'd the big male astronauts get them in there in the first place? I guess they thought they'd be sending up more kids later or something? Andy has to hook up the oxygen, but for some reason there's a complicated set of pipes and colors for a tank with one nozzle on it. It's to set up Rudy to have his moment. Everyone gets theirs. Tish knows Morse code, and since the shuttle wasn't prepped properly, there's no long-range communication. But she's able to use telemetry lights to send Morse code down to NASA, where the mission control guys don't see it. You know, 
They're known to be very unobservant and have empty station when a shuttle's in orbit. Yeah, okay, I know. It wasn't supposed to be there, but believe me, once it was, the controllers would have been pulled from wherever they were to get their butts in the seats. Finally, when Andy begins to install the second tank, something goes wrong and the tank smashes her into the back wall, killing her instantly and sending the shuttle off course thanks to the laws of physics. Ha ha ha, gotcha again. She's only mildly injured, just enough so that Catherine needs to be the one to pilot the shuttle home and have her moment. They all land safely and a fun adventure is had by all. Okay, I've been hard on this movie. And in some cases, it's probably deserving. But the truth is, I kind of like it. It's hard is in the right place. In an era of movies about kids going to space, at least this attempted to be more grounded in reality, as opposed to Fly the Navigator or Explorers. The movie costs about $20 million, and although dated, the special effects are definitely above average. In the original script, they had a bunch of Russian space camp kids coming up to rescue them, which would have been a complete slap in the face on so many levels, but thankfully that aspect was dropped. What would a Soviet space camp have been like? Soviet space gulag? Space concentration camp? The shoot was supposed to be six months, but went on for ten, leading the cast to start calling the movie Space Cramp. It's not just a movie, it's a career. They even had t-shirts made up. The shooting happened in the summer of 1985, but just before it was released, the Challenger happened. Well, a $20 million movie can't just be shelved. This delayed the release, which probably worked to its further disadvantage. See, if they had released it in January, nobody would have gone. But by delaying it, not only did no one go, but now they were accused of trying to cash in on the disaster by some critics, which was really unfair. Dr. Deborah Barnhart, the current CEO of Space Camp, was doing a stint as a director there back when the movie came out and claims that attendance doubled after the film's release and continues to be a top destination for kids. When the Challenger exploded, the director, Harry Weiner, honestly thought the film would be okay as he thought people needed the hope the film represented. And he admits he was totally wrong. Quote, They saw it as a source of jeopardy, of disappointment, of tragedy rather than hope. No one went to see Space Camp the movie, so then I felt like I'd failed miserably. In the end, it only made $10 million at the box office and was probably destined to flop no matter what. Roger Ebert panned the dialogue as dumb and the direction and editing as slow-footed. Ebert concluded, Would anyone like this movie? Juvenile space nuts, maybe, but they'd be too sophisticated. Personally, I think he was rather harsh on it, and probably like everyone else at the time, was too emotionally biased against it after the tragedy. But he's not totally wrong. Space Camp was not strong enough or serious enough to work after the disaster. The various scientific mistakes really feel disrespectful given the circumstances. At least I might have thought so at the time if I was this old then. But now 35 years have passed, we can see the movie with fresh eyes. A reasonably decent, mid-80s, kids' space movie that had some interesting ideas, tried to be more grounded in realism than its competition, but executed haphazardly. What will they make now that they are revisiting it? I would imagine that they would tie it into the private space race, bringing in an Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos type of billionaire to partner with NASA to get a new crop of young astronauts, Maybe go to Mars? I just hope they bring back the soundtrack. So, if you want a fun, light, breezy little adventure, something you can watch with the young ones, and you'll both enjoy it, then you might give it a watch. It deserves better than what fate dealt it.